Do you think this could be a trap? Well, we have to investigate the court at some point, right? Meeting the king himself would be a fantastic opportunity to do that. I say we go for it. If something happens, we'll just turn the whole place upside down. Uh, that sounds a little intense. After a quick discussion, you nod to the guards and agree to follow. They lead you all the way to the audience hall of the palace. Gilded tables line both sides of the hall. The space itself is adorned with all manner of expensive antiques, glass shelves, and silver candlesticks. The items appear quite ordinary in size and dimension, yet their presence somehow makes the emptiness of the hall feel even more surreal and ominous. Wow, it's so luxurious! The elderly king, clad in a magnificent robe, sits upon the deep crimson throne before you. He wears above his head a majestic crown, with a gemstone the size of a bird's egg set right at the very front. As you observe it, you see a complex pattern of light reflect off its surface. Ahem! <clears throat> They're here, your majesty. A man dressed in dark clothes, likely a minister, shields his mouth with his hands and bends down to whisper a few words to the king. After a moment, he lowers his hands and stands back up. His gaze shifts to fixate on your group, but he does not move from his place at the king's side. The king does not appear entirely aware of his surroundings. The man by his side, though. We should keep a close eye on him. The king remains still and says nothing. The minister is the one who speaks. Esteemed guests, allow me to thank you for coming to our faraway kingdom. Unfortunately, His Majesty the King finds himself quite exhausted from work. So please allow me, his Prime Minister, to welcome you in his stead. I've heard tell that your group, the Marachose Hunters, used your exceptional ability with the sword to repel the monsters near the capital. Such a great deed deserves to be rewarded. However, seeing that I was not fortunate enough to observe such a feat with my own eyes, you'll forgive me for seeking to verify the truth by speaking to you myself. Well, we've got nothing to hide. You brought us here to talk, right? So we'll just explain what happened. The golem's blades were so powerful, they could cut down trees in a single swipe! It took a lot of effort to defeat them, even for trained swordsmen like us. Well, that was enough details, right? Believe us now? Hmm. Your account does indeed match those of the survivors. Since you were the ones who defeated the monsters, that must mean you are also in possession of the treasure they stole. Well, we did take the treasure, but... How did he know about the treasure? Ah, then I must ask that you return it at once. It belongs to the kingdom. Wait, but didn't you just say that our great deed deserved a reward? Shouldn't the treasure be considered a part of that? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that was indeed what I said. But you seem to have forgotten a very important distinction. Only that which is freely given by the king can be considered a reward. Taking the rightful wealth of a kingdom without said permission, on the other hand, is a crime. But that's completely unreasonable! Yeah, that makes no sense! If it weren't for us, the treasure would still be buried underground somewhere! Maybe so, yet the fact remains. You tried to dispose of the treasure without reporting it to the court and without receiving permission, yes? Um... What? No answer? Surely you're not insinuating that you, a group of legendary Mara Shose hunters, sought to take the treasure for yourselves? I... well... what about the king? Is he just gonna let this guy talk for him the whole time? Clad in his magnificent robe, the king remains seated, with his hands resting on either side of the throne. His posture is rigid and unmoving, 
He stares forward with an empty look in his eyes, completely unmoved by the events before him. <sighs> From the look of things, could the Prime Minister be the evil sorcerer? Or could both the King and the Prime Minister have fallen under the evil sorcerer's control? I would like to observe the number of guards stationed in the hall. The guards in the palace appear fully armed, their expressions solemn. Sensing the tense atmosphere in the room, they stand at the ready, each with a hand placed upon the hilt of their sword, as if prepared to draw their weapons and surround you at a moment's notice. Well, there goes my plan to turn the whole place upside down, I guess. It appears we've been visited by nothing more than a group of ill-intentioned impostors. What a pity. Got? Take them away and throw them in the dungeons. Before I decide your fate, however, I must first determine whether you have any accomplices outside the court. Can't we try to slip away? Or maybe start some kind of riot? But if we try to fight the guards right now... Don't worry. At least we figured out who's behind all this. Let's just play it by ear. If you're scared, Paimon, just hold my hand. Aw, thanks, you guys. You allow yourself to be led away by guards surrounding you on both sides. It's only when you begin to feel drops of water falling from the dungeon ceiling and smell the stench of death and decay all around you, that you finally realize you've stepped into a completely different world. Stay here, and don't try anything funny. The guards lock the cell door and leave without looking back. Wait, sir! Your voice echoes through the dark hall, but the only response you receive is the sound of water dripping from the ceiling. What should we do now? Carve out a new path of fate with our own two hands, of course. I draw my weapon. You reach toward your waist, but find nothing there. You now recall that your weapons were confiscated before the guards locked you in the cell. The bag of treasure along with them. Uh, what about that knife I hid in my boot? When did you hide it in there? When I was thinking about digging a tunnel. Rejected. You failed to inform the GM of this course of action. Moreover, the guards would have conducted a thorough search before throwing you in prison. And the keys to the cell aren't anywhere to be seen? Correct. You don't even feel a lock hole on the cell door. Oh, well, there goes all our plans. Indeed. Huh? Why are you the one saying indeed? Because that statement holds true for me as well. This is where the script ends. What? But that's a terrible ending! This should be the point where the scriptwriter gives the players some kind of hint. Or gives the GM some kind of code for how to move forward. Uh, I mean, maybe they just really wanted us to be immersed in the feeling of being in prison? Like, they'll only show us the way out once we've grown truly and utterly desperate? That is a possibility. <sighs> if only there were desserts and tea in real prison. Oh, wait, guess that's kind of how the Fortress of Meripede works if you're lucky. Oh, before I forget, Navia, the short sword you had with you earlier. I took a closer look, and the craftsmanship doesn't appear to resemble anything from this era. If I remember correctly, that style was last in vogue several hundred years ago. Wait, Cloran said that sword used to belong to her master, right? Does that mean her master has been alive that long? I doubt it. The way she went about things often made her seem childish more than anything. I'd say the sword was most likely an heirloom passed down over time. Uh, hang on. A precious heirloom passed down to you by your master. And you gave it to me just like that? You weren't worried I might lose it? Master left many things to me when she disappeared. There was the sword, an old key, and a good amount of junk she probably just didn't want to take with her. I gave you the sword back then, because... 
I didn't want our friendship to end. Wait, when did this happen exactly? Hmm. After the duel. Between Mr. Callus and myself. Uh... Before that, Clorand would have meals with us and even stay over at the Spina some days. She was on great terms with Papa as well. After the duel, though, there was a period of time where we simply didn't know how to face each other. She entrusted the sword to me, and never came back. <laughs> we were both sad, and conflicted, and totally overthinking everything as a result. <laughs> Whenever I looked at the sword, I couldn't help but wonder. If Miss Petronia had never introduced us to each other at that picnic, maybe part of the sadness I was feeling could have been avoided. Back then, it felt like I hadn't just lost a father. Change the past. The most important thing is that you two found your way back to each other and can enjoy things like this together. Yep, you're right. I'm sorry, you two. I didn't mean to bring up any sad memories. Think nothing of it. No one here is at fault. Uh, huh? Oh, uh, looks like the next part of our script is here. <sighs> Perfect timing. The situation was really starting to get desperate. And not just because of the present thing. From Clarence's face, Paima really can't tell if it's good news or bad news. Hmm. Water continues to drip from the ceiling. In this lightless dungeon, you lack a reliable way to tell how much time has passed. Eventually, you get used to the unpleasant odor of straw, mold, and rust and find yourselves alternating between fits of drowsiness and despair. Suddenly, you hear footsteps outside the door. Heads up, everyone. Someone's coming. Gather close, everyone, and keep your voice down.